At this point, it's my very big pleasure to introduce Don Drum, American sculptor, designer, and master craftsman. I was fascinated when I read the bio, bio that Don started the art of medicine. He studied at Harem College and then saw the light and decided to go to the fine arts and the uh, visual arts. So he's made a transition. We all know him. We all have been touched by his work. We all know his work. And now we're going to get to know a little bit more about him. So we appreciate Don joining us today. We've already made him an invitation to come back anytime. And we may bring his name to our board if we're looking at uh, making some honorary Rotarians in the future. So without further ado, Don Drum. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to talk to you, particularly people of Akron. I have felt, and my wife feels the same way, that we have been successful in Akron because of Akron people. Somebody asked me the other day to talk a little bit about what I loved about Ohio or what I loved about Akron. And I said, not the trees or the roads, but the people. Uh, I would not be able to have a gallery or succeed or practice without the love of Akron, uh, my love to you and yours to me, to keep our gallery going and to create a uh, lifestyle that allows me to work all over the country, but particularly in Akron. I'm, I'm going, going to show you today a group of photos that will um, give you a little bit of background. And I'll talk a little bit about how I got into art. I um, decided upon graduation, I, I go to Hiram College. I wanted to be a veterinarian or a doctor. I didn't know uh, that much about what was going on, but I enrolled and was a freshman. And at Hiram College at the time, we studied one thing at a time. Uh, they were called terms rather than quarters or uh, other divisions of university life. And these terms, we had five. Each term lasted seven weeks. And at the end of uh, the term, you go to the next term. In other words, you'd have English, then you'd have biology, then you'd have math, then you'd have this or that. And that's all you studied for the seven weeks. Now, I have to tell you, because I learned this after college, that I'm very dyslectic. I uh, see things visually, I think of things visually, and things like mathematics are not my favorite subjects for some reason. Anyway, my last class of my freshman year was a math class. Uh, it was trigonometry, and... Um, I decided that I better get out of this class. Um, I don't think it was trig, it was something else. Anyway, it was a math class. And uh, we had three days at home to change our mind. So I went looking for something that might interest me. And we uh, had several things going on at the time. And I walked up into this one building and there was a neat art class going on. And they were working away and what have you. The teacher's name was uh, Mayo Johnson. And Mayo, uh, I said to her, uh, I'd like to take this class. I'm dropping another class. And she said, oh, sir, we're very sorry, but we're filled with 18 students. And whatever I said, I said the right thing. And I turned around and walked out, or started to walk out. And I said, I guess I'll have to drop out of school this uh, term. And she said, oh, no, no, sir, we're going to make room for you. And that was the best thing that ever happened. That turned my life around. Um, I had fooled with art and what have you in high school, but it was never anything serious. We're adjusting here, and we're going to start showing what I do. Um, can everyone see the slides? Can, yeah, can everyone see the slides all right? Yes. 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 This is me. 
uh, I was probably about 24, 25, 26 at this time. And I'm working in a foundry. The foundry, as many of you probably know, uh, deals with using sand as a molding material and casting uh, directly into it. My specialty became aluminum. And the way this happened was uh, I transferred from Hiram to Kent, received my Bachelor of, of Fine Arts there. I was offered a Master of Arts, worked in a Master of Arts, and then left and came to work in Akron for a company called Smith, Sher and McDermott. Smith, Sher and McDermott were, were an industrial design firm that designed things for industry. Lawnmowers, uh, refrigerators, all kinds of things. They also had a section that uh, did graphic design. And I worked with them and they sent me over to a little company that uh, one of the partners owned that manufactured basketball molds. Uh, they, this gentleman came out of Sun Rubber that made a lot of toys and brought a process with them. And they were uh, making cast aluminum basketball mold, but it was very technical. And they wanted me to see if I could use the facilities to create a line of products that they could sell to New York, uh, just as uh, something to uh, do. And one of the processes we used uh, was sand casting. I'm going to jump ahead because this can be boring after a while. This is the mold pulled apart. And at that time, I carved directly into the mold. I'm getting ahead of myself. At that time, there were there was a mold shop next door, and I would go over there after work. And they, I had an old uh, foundry there that cast aluminum for the tire industry, and I spent time on my hands and knees learning to uh, cast. Brought the technique back into that shop that I was working in, and we started making things. But they had to close down after couple years because they just didn't have the money to keep it going. They encouraged me to go on my own. They even gave me space in the building while they were uh, dismantling it over a, a couple uh, months. And then the gentleman uh, next door offered me a place to work and uh, help the foundry keep going. That's, that's the basic thing of how I got into aluminum. But I also felt that much of my ability would uh, be better spent working with tradespeople and things out in industry. And eventually, uh, after I got going, uh, I was invited to become artist in residence for Bowling Green State University, where I worked both in Akron and in Bowling Green, Ohio. I spent six years doing this. The first project I worked on of any size was the new library at Bowling Green. There were two um, concrete walls, one a butterfly wall, which we're looking at, and then a wall in the back that was flat, and they wanted me to design a mural on it. And I climbed up 10 stories high with my knees shaking and <laughs> learned to become used to the height and I laid out directly on the wall with paint what I wanted to cut. Then I trained sandblasters to come behind me and actually cut out the areas I painted, which are dark in this case. That's another story, we'll go on with that later, but let's see what else we have here. Uh, I continue working in cement and what have you, and one of the jobs I did was uh, for the airport up in Cleveland, the uh, in-town airport or the Burke Lakefront Airport, where the second floor was set up for a restaurant, but nobody ever quite got anything going. John Mazzola, who was then one of the best interior designers in Ohio, uh, received the job. He was here in Akron. And I had done a lot of work with him and he hired me to do some walls and things. So I actually worked on the site fabricating 
these walls and working with a team of cement blasters. We had stained glass in this wall as well as cement. We also used some teak wood with cement. This is a downstairs restaurant, a little coffee shop, where we drew on the top of a, a concrete-like top or material, and we gathered um, gears and things, and we used them in the wall as part of the design. We won some awards on that. There's my beautiful bride, and uh, she literally, because of my lack of... Uh, mental capacity and the <laughs> math <laughs> um, runs a studio for me. This was taken down in Pimlin, North Carolina when I had a wild beard. Here I was making a cookie cutter, embracing. The first big core 10 piece I did, which a lot of people have heard of, was the piece at Kent State. Kent received a grant to bring industrial designers or industrial art teachers into Kent. I think they were about 25. They had enough money to bring their family and kids in and they spent the summer uh, going through some different creative projects. They felt that these people knew how to weld, how to build things, but did not think creatively. So uh, I was asked as one of the participants in this to uh, do something with these people, and my field was sculpture. So I went to a steel manufacturer and had these plates cut and delivered in a pile with a welder. And I uh, made three channels or, or tubes, square tubes, and cement uh, set them in concrete to be ready. So I think they were prepared like three or four weeks before this, these people arrived. When they arrived, we began working on uh, Core 10. Now many of you know Core 10, you've seen it. It's an old formula that was designed by U.S. Steel and railroad cars and rusty things like this you would see on a railroad track are actually Core 10. They're made out of a steel that has 7% copper in it and holds its rust, unlike your automobile fender, which will continue to uh, go down or fall apart. This steel is made to rust, to hold the rust, as long as it wet dries, wet dries, and it turns this beautiful, almost purple brown. Anyway, this is unfortunately the piece that was in the line of fire when uh, the National Guard at the students at Kent and I had to go down and look at the hole that uh, punctured the sculpture, one of the holes. I wish that they had all punctured the sculpture instead of students. That's when four students died. And that happened on a Monday, May 4th, 1970. I was on the campus that Thursday. Uh, I took a piece of steel I had the same thickness and we found a marksman there and we went out into a field. We marked an X on it in case it flipped midair when it was fired upon. We created the same exact duplicate of the shot that the uh, National Guard shot at the students and hit the sculpture. So we showed that it came from the, the uh, guard, not the students. Uh, one of the things I did um, was to work with the architects that designed and developed uh, Quaker Square. And Quaker Square was, uh, as you remember, the home of Quaker Oats. When I first came here in 1958, you could smell them roasting or firing or popping, whatever they did to uh, oats. And then you go around the corner and you smell rubber vulcanizing. And then you go around another company or corner and you would get a mix of this, which would make you gag. Well, fortunately, I guess the smell of rubber is gone. The, um, maybe that's not good, I don't know. But uh, they, the Quaker people went to Grand Rapids 
and they left behind this uh, wonderful group of uh, silos. Uh, Ness, uh, Mr. Nesbaum uh, was one of the people that pulled it together and uh, I was hired by the architects and Mr. Nesbaum to design and create artwork for the uh, inn or uh, hotel that they designed within the group of the larger uh, silos. This is a place where one would um, clock in or uh, reserve a room and then you move through the doors. We'll see what other photos here. You moved in through these doors, which were actually the outside of silos, but they were incorporated within a roof and a room uh, so that they became indoor space. And we created five uh, sunbursts on one side and across them was another one where I put one sunburst and Jay Nesbaum said to me, um, make the one sunburn smile sun face smile, but make the other five sort of uh, sad. I said, all right. I said, why? And he said, those are the five banks that would not give me a loan to create this, this uh, facility. And I'm smiling because we were able to. I also did houses. This is a technique of what, what we call cement plastering, uh, where I carved different colors. This was the, the original Tamarius house down in the valley. Unfortunately, after three or four years, they divorced and uh, he's still in town. His ex moved away. But uh, I had great fun and joy of creating artwork all over the front of the building, carving directly into it. We started with a dark layer of cement below and then layered over a tan layer and then carved and stroke and uh, drew in the cement until it hardened. You see, I've involved myself with a lot of different techniques and workmen that uh, taught me different techniques. This is a uh, building for storage of food in an outhouse, part of our zoo. And you see, uh, back in those days, I uh, loved to fantasize for kids and I made great elephants on skinny legs. This was sandblasted into the brick. The outside of the brick was tan. The inner cut areas were uh, red in it and it showed very well. And we cut about a half inch into the concrete. Back in the foundry again, I grew a beard and I was a little bit older. These are some of the things I specialize in, and aluminum is still my major metal in the foundry. Uh, we do everything from small items, serving trays, um, great bowls. I love bowls, and they allow me to create all kinds of decoration on the outside. We do trivets and odd things, and we sell them in the gallery, but I'm only one person of 500 in the gallery that uh, we sell. This is a fountain for downtown Akron. Many of you have seen it. It was created back uh, with Percival Goodman. I think it was his name. He was a landscape architect uh, out of uh, the West or California in San Francisco. They flew me out there. I spent a week there working with him. And the idea behind the fountain was that the sculpture uh, would be a centerpiece and water would shoot up around it. But that water uh, would be cooled as it fired off and lose heat. Meanwhile, it would transfer a cooler temperature over across from it on the same plaza to create ice skating. Well, it worked for a couple of years and then stopped working and they were always fighting. I'm so glad that I insisted on no piping within the sculpture. After several years, they decided to save the sculpture. They moved it closer to the uh, road uh, to Main Street, made a new base for it. 
this is a new base for it. And they concreted in the area that was supposed to be for uh, uh, ice skating. Do I still have you with me or have you fallen asleep? No, we're still right with you. Oh, good, good. Yell if you get tired. Uh, this is an interesting piece. This piece uh, is up on the John Morley House Center. This is called um, Sky Notch. It's made out of core 10. And while we were putting it up or supervising the installation of it, I looked over the side and saw a whole group of men standing there. And I waved down, they came up and it turned out that they were the Royal London Concert uh, or Choir. I, I don't know, maybe it was called the Queen's Choir, whatever, but they were all people who were retired. They came on a tour through America to give a uh, concert. So they plotted me on or edged me on here to do this and uh, watched me. And then they came over to the house that night and drank about all the booze I had. <laughs> There's a sky notch after it received its, con or its uh, wonderful uh, finish. It was sandblasted and then uh, allowed to rust and it rusts very evenly. I'm standing on the other side. The photographer put me up on the ladder. I also uh, did a school very near my house, a Portage Path School, where we sandblasted uh, an Indian head. I worked with uh, Mr. Ott or Dr. Ott, uh, and I didn't know it, but he was uh, sort of an Indian expert uh, in school. He came, I think, from Kentucky to be our uh, head of our school board. and. He said, hey, we're adding this new addition on, and I want you to uh, design an Indian for me. And I designed two or three, and we went to lunch, and he said, no, these aren't the ones. These aren't the ones. And I said, I know. You want the one I've got laying back on my drawing thing. And he said, we're done eating. And we left and went back to my studio. He said, that's the one. It was an Indian from the Great Lakes area. And uh, Portage Path was part of Portage Trail that the Indians carried their canoes down from the Great Lakes down to the um, Summit Lakes or Portage Lakes or what have you. And uh, was a main uh, way down Portage Path. So that was the reason for the Indian. Well, then time went on and the Indian was destroyed when the building was destroyed. And the teacher said, hey, you've got to do something with the Indian inside. So I took the design, I cut it out of metal with brass and aluminum and hung it in the stairway where you enter. And that's that piece. I like hanging things in ceiling, particularly with different colors and materials. This is a library downtown and uh, this is in the hallway down by the auditorium. This is a sun and moon is back of it. it has a couple different shots. Probably six, seven feet across. This is a sculpture we did for the, the Gay Olympics that was held all oh, oh, I I, several years ago, it sits in front of the um, John S. Knight Center. The, the what? John S. Knight Center. The John S. Knight Center. I'm glad I have a helper here to, that knows the city <laughs> better than I do. Anyway, um, there was money left over from the Olympics that they had in Cleveland and Akron, and they asked me to design a piece of sculpture that would show four or five different sports. We had baseball and we had horse riding, we had volleyball and I think swimming and golf. You can see the people there. There's Russ Pry that unfortunately died soon after this piece was uh, donated. One of the most interesting 
projects I've had where clients who built housing across from the university for university students. And uh, this is where the group of shops are in the front building and uh, the housing is behind it. The housing was developed around two, um, I don't know what you call them, atriums or open, open to the, yeah, courtyards, thank you. <laughs> it's open to two courtyards. This courtyard, they commissioned me to do three sculptures in steel, they're about 12 feet high. And then the other one, they bought different pieces from the studio and put in. And the students at the uh, university that live there uh, get to eat out in the, when the weather's nice and what have you. Unfortunately, I don't know how they're doing now with the uh, disease. This is one of them that uh, I liked. Now again, it's core 10 and it's my favorite outdoor sculpture material uh, besides uh, using stainless steel. I don't do too much sculpture of any size outdoor in aluminum. Uh, I feel that there are problems with it uh, through electrolysis and what have you, but I do like core 10 and I do work with stainless. This is a piece over in Cuyahoga Falls a uh, group of people who work with computers. In fact, they do some work for us with computers. Um, commissioned me to do something in this building. They got a grant, bought an old foundry over there and cleaned it up and uh, commissioned me to do something. And I thought, well, this had gears and material and things in that would be fun to use a little color with the cut aluminum pieces and gears as part of it. So this is a, a hanging sculpture that is floating in uh, this from the ceiling. A little closer look of it. It hasn't fallen on anybody. This is a piece that um, we did for LeBron James at the uh, wonderful school that he's doing with the connection to uh, uh, the public school system. And every kid that works his way through, I understand will receive a college education. And it was a real joy to do this piece for him. Again, it's a non-objective thing. And I should talk a little bit about non-objective art as compared to abstract art. There are three basic groups that you could put most art, most sculpture into. You have realism where an artist works with something uh, and makes it realistic uh, that you recognize. Then there's abstraction where you may take that uh, realistic idea and abstract it, change it, take the color, the shape of what all, distort it. You may have an idea what it came from, you may not. And then there's non-objective art, which I, like using for outdoor sculpture, which has no subject matter. It's to be appreciated for the beauty of the shapes, the color, uh, the way you play one shape against the other. And I use the sunlight a lot. In fact, I call a lot of the pieces I do uh, totems, towers, or ziggurats, just to have a name for them because I don't like to name things. I feel that the piece should be appreciated for what it is, and that's it. Don, we're running, we're running out of time, and there are a couple questions. So uh, I don't know if you have a finale that you want to show us, or if you want to have uh, Connor oh, Jarvis give yeah. questions. Connor, do you want I to take over? So long. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, no, no per perfect. I don't want to cut cut down off. So no, this has been phenomenal. What a uh, let me get my photo here. You're not just talking to a you know, talking to a wax thing. No, uh, this has been phenomenal, and we've had a few questions pop in and, and some interesting comments as well. And one I comment I wanted to share is from Claudine Schooley, who had said uh, that Don will be happy to know she's going to use the Angel of Peace sculpture that he had designed. Uh, between Ukraine and Russia at the inter-country rotary ceremony on September 12th as a symbol of peace between those two countries. So 
Um, that was a comment from Claudine Schooley that I thought definitely needed to be shared. Well, I know why that's important to me. My roommate through Kent, both in undergraduate and graduate school, was a Ukrainian. That wasn't that far after the Second World War, and there were a lot of students from all over. Wow, wow. That, I mean, spectacular, Claudine. Thank you for sharing that, too. And uh, I want to make sure we get to a few of the questions here. So Cheryl Warren had a, had, had a trio of questions. First was, Don, Don what's, what's your, your overall favorite, favorite project, project which you have created, if, if you, you can, can answer that? I can't. I cannot. Each <laughs> one is the next one. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on one now. I, I do Superstition keeps me from talking too much about it, but it's a big stainless steel piece that will go into one of the parks soon. And uh, we're fabricating it down in North Carolina. I work with a group down there uh, that uh, has worked with me for probably 25, 30 years now in fabrication work. They do the best work that uh, I can find for what I want to do. Okay. Um, Follow-up follow question from, from, from Cheryl on, on that as far as just pieces in the gallery. You, you, did you say, is it correct to say you have 500 artists selling at your gallery? Is that, yes. is that accurate? We, we have 500 on the floor at one time. We have 2,000 in our computers in case you have something unusual or what all that you want us to see if we can have made for you. Okay. And, and how, how are those artists selected, Cheryl was also wanting to know. Um, when we first started, I decided, or we, my wife and I decided, we did not want a gallery just to show local people. We wanted a gallery that would show what's going on nationally. We bought our building, I started my company in 60, but we bought our building in 70, where it is now. And we decided in 71 to open a gallery. And I took one quarter of the space out of the shop and held it till I could afford to coax different friends into putting things in. And we started finding people all over. I taught at Penland School of Art for 14 summers. And there were a great group of uh, craftsmen from all over the country that came there, plus other faculty. And we were able to incorporate a lot of their work. And then uh, they started, the field started shows. Uh, they were in, in farm, not farmland, but they were in fairgrounds. Uh, and we started going to those and showing ourselves. And we picked up a lot of craftsmen from them. And now they've become very sophisticated. There's a great one in Philly. There's wow. a great one in Baltimore that you go to just like you would a furniture store or any other kind of uh, uh, national um, show. Wow. Very, very interesting. And uh, Dr. Rob, do we have time for a couple more here? Well, I think we're going to have to, uh, if he's willing to stick around a little bit afterwards, we can read that. We, we keep, Don, we keep our, our team meeting open for 15 minutes for people who really want a chance to, to chat. But this has been phenomenal. And I think we would have questions go uh, long beyond, beyond yes. your lunchtime. And, uh, but, but we really, we really appreciate, we were very grateful that you could join us today. And it was Really fascinating. I, I thought I knew some of your thank artwork you and I knew a fraction me. of it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's nice thank to... you. And we're, we'll need to wrap up. It's two minutes till one. And please, Don, come back. We, we would love to hear you back. We, we would love to have you back as a speaker or as a guest. Uh, before I break and give the lotto to, to uh, David Hall, Happy birthday to Janice Radel, Andrew Grover, and Terry Dalton, who will have birthdays before our next meeting. And <clears throat> happy anniversary to the club, Marilyn Bucky, tw 32 years, Pamela Kiltow, 33 years, and Marsha, our invocator, Marsha Holcomb, 17 years. So David, do you want to do the lotto? And then I'll close the meeting. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, said I have a, a random function to pick. Uh, we had... Uh, uh, seven players and a total of uh, 35 entries, and our winner is Michael Shearer. 
So congratulations, right. Mike. And if you would give me a, a number between one and 35. And then mute, you, mute yourself. Yeah. Is he on? Is he still on? I think he had to go. Did he have oh. to go? All right. I'll catch up with him later to do the, to do the progressive. All right. Thank you, David. And thank you, everybody, for attending. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Don, Amazing. Yes, Don, thank you so much. You had a, a lot of thank yous. I don't know if you can see the, the comments at all, but you have plenty of thank yous and wows coming in. And, uh, I saw you turn off your screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I everybody. Been there for a little bit. They, they, those watching the recording don't need to see too much of my face. So, yeah. <laughs> I'll be glad to but, answer anything else you want right now. Um, well, well, David Hall, and I think he's still on. He had asked your inspiration for the sun and moon designs, and he was joking and say, "Hey, don't tell us it's the sun and the moon." What were your inspirations for that? Those those famous designs of yours. I'm asked that all the time, and I refer back to art school when we were taking a class in shapes and design and what have you, and the professor said, you know, a circle is a complete statement. And it's one of the hardest things to design because it's complete in itself. And that became sort of a challenge. And pretty soon I was designing things within the circle. They became the sunburst. And I have continued to do sunbursts up till now. Uh, just as a fun wow. thing. I don't consider them that serious. Every society in the world uses a sun some way because it gives us light, right. it gives us food. Um, it's inspirational and it's fun. Um, so my answer to that question is I do suns because I get bored sometimes with other things and <laughs> like to doodle. <laughs> well, I can say my, my wife and I have several of those around the house and uh, not just from our own purchases, but gifts from family and, and friends as well. And I'm sure many on this uh, call still and previously can attest to that and uh, just, you know, big fan of your work and, and so thankful for you taking the time today. Um, I can, I know this is after the normal meeting uh, slot here. So I, I, guys, if anyone else has other questions, I think I've mentioned everything that was uh, a specific question in the chat, but does anyone else have anything specifically? Tom Knauer. Hey, uh, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. When you make the outdoor pieces, the 10 or 12 foot sculptures, what's the time frame from concept to production on something like that? Is, does it vary a lot or you, you kind of have a system and methodology vary. that's pretty predictable? Um, some, of, some of the pieces, are joy to start and complete. Some of the pieces are real pain and you work harder on those to make them come right. right. Uh, a big outdoor piece may last two or three months. It may uh, last longer than that, a half a year. But usually it's a matter of coordination. And I work with this group in North Carolina who, because um, I was at a show once and they knew I did some welding and some things, and they did a lot of cut things. And they had just bought a big cutting device, a big fancy table that cut both uh, with water jet and with plasma. And they needed to pay it off. And they said, hey, we would like to do work for you if you would see it. So I sent a few little things down. It blossomed into doing very big pieces which they ship up to me and we've been doing it i think probably 30 years now um it makes it much easier for me because i will create a model in cardboard paint it to look like whatever the final metal will be and then i uh accompany that with the drawings and i send the model and the drawings to them they immediately put it on their computer and uh, tell me uh, the cost of the metal at a certain size and fabrication and what all. Then I go before my client and say, well, this is what they say and I want a little for me and um, uh, we create. 
and wow. uh, we use TV to go back and forth, or if it really runs into a problem, then I'll go down there. But uh, normally I can handle uh, any problem we run into, uh, handling it over the computer. So the bigger pieces sometimes are really the fun pieces. Mm. Did I explain? Thank you, Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Did, did, Rob, did you, you have a question? Oh, sorry, someone else talking. Tom, are you still talking? I, just, I had one more follow-up, Connor. I'm sorry. Don, do you do most of your aluminum casting in Akron? Do you do most of the smaller pieces yes, yourself? Yes, I learned. I learned to cast uh, in Akron. I worked with a man named Claude Rainbolt, and he ran the foundry for this tire mold shop next door to the uh, group that was renting the space that, that I was hired to work in the industrial design firm. And then I eventually went over and worked with him five years. And then uh, they closed down that section and I rented uh, a space down under the high level bridge, the old bridge, and uh, from the old Frank Madden company. And we um, made a foundry there, but we had no running water. We had to collect all our water in, in big barrels outside every time it rained. It worked out five years there. And then I, uh, a friend of mine came down and worked for the city and said, hey, we're going to build a new bridge. That bridge is falling apart. And so uh, he said, you've got to look for something else. So I panicked. I called a real estate man. I found the building that I'm in now. Eight years later, they built the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Boy. Thanks for that answer. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, Don, Dr. Rob, yeah. Yeah, Don, I, I had a question. You mentioned that your favorite material to build outdoor sculpture. Did you say it's core 10? And yeah. What, and what is that? C-O-R-10. Uh, oh. It's the trade name for U.S. Steel. It's also called all-weathering steel. And okay. you, have, you have seen it. Many times when you had to stop by a railroad and wait for these coal cars or what all go by, these rusty looking coal or these rusty looking cars are made out of core tin. It's a 1930 something formula. It's not a new formula. But wow. after the war, architects began looking at these high rise building and using steel. And steel, they had to paint all the time, they had to prime it paint it and if it got a pinhole it start rusting what have you so they went to U.S. Steel and they said what do you have that we could use and they came up with core 10 and one of the first buildings built was in Pittsburgh I think the U.S. Steel building wow that's great thanks Connor yes Steve I have, I have a question hey Don um have you done much along the lines of mentoring other what you would consider burgeoning artists that uh, kind of have a dream living inside of them? Um, I tried to, and we've done a couple, but it's sort of hard because we're a working studio and we will hire uh, people in the front, art students in the front. I think at least half of them or more are connected with the arts and some of them create and sell things while they're working here. Uh, but in the back, it has been very difficult to, uh, they get bored. What happens is they come out of a school, and I did this myself, come out of the school thinking they're God's gift to the art field and start working and get bored. And they say, my God, I have to stand here and file this all day. That's not exciting, or I have to grind it on the grinder or whatever. So that normally has not worked out for me. Uh, it works out better in the front, in the selling end of the gallery. They get a chance to see what professional artists have gone through and learning to create a market, learning what kind of items sell best. Um, you have to learn a little marketing. Not a lot, but a little. I mean, you don't sit down and say, well, what does the client want today? But you have to learn presentation, how to um, show a client what you can do. If they come to you on a dining room table, you better know a little bit about 
the materials they're going to work with and what type of table they want. Things like this you have to learn. And we do better at that in the sales end than we do in, in the work end. Well, great. I, I love hearing that there's a, you know, being in the business world, a business, we're all in business, but a business aspect to the creative side as well, too. That That's fascinating to me and, and uh, maybe, maybe not as much to others. Um, but Cheryl, you had said you had a uh, question you'd like to ask Don as well. Um, Don, first, I want to thank you because you have been amazingly gracious. You have been amazingly gracious. Um, donating many of your pieces to charities uh, for fundraisers. And oh, you're not we, to know all that. That's we are so appreciative of that uh, throughout the community. Um, and whoops, I'm so sorry. Um, I also would like to ask about your family who's also uh, uh, does art. Do, many of your family members do art, glass blowing, etc. I wondered if you could touch on that. Well, um, First of all, we'll start with my wife. My wife has a degree from Ohio Wesleyan, a Bachelor of Fine Art, and I have a degree from Kent. Um, we met, uh, she came to Akron to teach. We met uh, at the uh, Akron Art Institute. She was taking a class in jewelry in the evening from Mary Ann Shear. Now, many of you may know her, may not know her, but she was one of the teachers at Canton and then taught uh, part-time at uh, the uh, night school. And I taught in the other room and I went in and I said, who's that good looking girl sitting over there? And we were introduced and from then on, <laughs> well, now I have three daughters, two of them, the oldest and the youngest are both in the art field. The oldest is Elisa, who lives up in Boston, is married to electronic engineer and went to Rhode Island School of Design. Her, her uh, husband went to Brown and they met up there. Uh, she does now wood sculpture that's painted. And she started with fashion, but she found that she liked uh, doing uh, things with wood that's painted. The youngest one has her studio next door to ours. And that's uh, Leandra. And Leandra uh, does a sandblasted glass and she does a line of pewter. And she's a fantastic um, detailist. Uh, mother, my wife, asked us uh, when this epidemic really got bad around Akron to design some pieces that could be sold and money given to the organization to help locally. And um, uh, Lily, my nickname for Leandra, uh, designed five or six beautiful detailed little things. Uh, and I designed, I think, one or two things, but she has done very well with those. And she's a, a fantastic artist and she sells through our gallery. The middle child teaches Chinese. She lived in China for seven years. She married a Chinese man who's now here. He's a, incidentally a wonderful cook. Uh, <laughs> but he works uh, up in Cleveland. Uh, his field was uh, business and he uh, works between an American company and suppliers in China when we're all talking um, and uh, does quite well doing that. If I answered any questions, <laughs> yeah, I get very much. to get what I'm talking about. And, uh, no, Cheryl, I, I think that answered Cheryl's question. Uh, more, very fascinating. We appreciate that additional background and insight as to the family. Uh, Morgan, you had a question, it sounds like. Yeah, is, um, is your daughter's shop the one in Wickford, Rhode Island? Is my what daughter? Is her shop in Wickford, Rhode Island? Um, she sells, she doesn't own a shop. She sells to other galleries. And I don't know those galleries that well. They come and go. Business. Okay, because I've been there often and it's called The Little Drummer. So, and I know some some of your artwork and his and her artwork is- well, what, what city is The Little Drummer in? Wickford, Rhode Island. Wickford, I don't know. I don't know Rhode Island that well. 
We, uh, our little shop is called The Different Drummer also. Okay. Of course, that's taken from my name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the little drummer. Well, I, I've, uh, I, I gotta say this has been, uh, you know, I, I can't, I guess necessarily, I haven't been on every Tuesday call we've had since we started doing the Zoom meetings, but since we've had this open forum afterwards, I think this is one of the most well attended after regular meeting forums, Don. So uh, just a testament to our fascination with you and, and your work, and it's truly been a treat to kind of peel back the curtain on uh, the man that is behind the artwork. So I know uh, uh, my questions have been answered. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any more? And I know this isn't my meeting to run, but I, uh, I looked and we're getting close to 115 here and, and I know everyone's got busy days. So I want to be respectful of your time, Don. Any other questions? I guess not. Well, let me say what? No, no. I said, all right. I just want to say goodbye to everybody and thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure.